a great show lined up for you tonight. So, don't go anywhere. Stay right where you are. We'll be right back. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Rob's Inner Circle Broadcasting Live on my personal Facebook page and the Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel and on the Rob's Inner Circle Twitch account. Thank you to everyone for tuning in to what is going to be an absolutely delightful show this evening. I want to give a shout out to my good friend and producer of Rob's Inner Circle, Jenny Duhame. And also another shout out to my other good friend, the podcast techie, Patty Saragosa. We would like to extend our congratulations to our friend and past guest on Rob's Inner Circle, who was on our show on episode 29, Mr. Georges Zutil. Georges and his colleagues who are part of Reflet de Société are finalists in five categories, for l'Association des médias écrits communautaires du Québec's Journalism Award. On behalf of myself and everybody here at Rob's Inner Circle, we would like to wish you the best of luck. Daily Struggles is up and rising on Rise Up TV on the Roku streaming service. And you can go on to um, the Rise Up channel and you can go watch all of our episodes of season one. And uh, good news, for those of you who have smart devices, you can download the apps and uh, you can get that uh, from your uh, either Apple Store or Google Play. And if you don't have that possibility, you can always get the streaming stick, the Amazon stick, on Amazon for as little as $30. Our merch shop is up and running, and this is thanks to our collaborative effort to Vinny the Hat Gargano, also known as... Vincent Gargano, thank you very much, Vinny, for the possibility that we have working with you. It's a whole lot of fun. And you can go on to 514brandingco.com. That's 514brandingco.com. And you can get our merch there for Daily Struggles and Rob's Inner Circle. Very affordable items at excellent prices. We also invite you to go subscribe to Bobby's Short Shorts. Go onto the channel, click on the playlists. Check out the uh, productions we've had in the past. I like this uh, production here a half hour after the, the broadcast. It's going to be up and running on the channel. So you can go on there and uh, click. Give us some nice comments. Give us some blue thumbs going this way. Some likes. You want to share. You want to subscribe. And also hit the notification bell because you'll be the first ones to know every time a new production goes up. Folks, it's that time once again to slip into the weekly ritual to let out the steam, to sit back, relax, let all the pressure fall, and let us carry the load. It's that time once again, guys. It's showtime. It's time to bring on our guest. Let's get it on. Our guest tonight is an absolutely delightful guest. He's absolutely talented, Jordanian-born composer, her music has been recognized. She's won an award in Hollywood for the excellence of her music. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's bring on our guest, Miss Swad Bushnak. Thank you, Rob. You know why? Because I said that this is an amazing moment for Swad. I wanted her to savor it. Thank you so much for being with us on our show tonight. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Wow, it is such an honor. Uh, you are such a talented performer. You uh, you won an award and you, your music is like recognized all over. You've been working on some local projects and all that. But before we get into that, let's get to know you a little bit. So you were actually born in Jordan and you came to Canada a little later on. So talk to us a little bit uh, when you were growing up as, in Jordan, what it was like and what your aspirations were. Yes, so I'm born and raised in Jordan. Uh, my mom is Syrian. My dad is uh, half Palestinian, half Bosnian. 
And uh, I grew up in a house filled with music, um, classical music, uh, you know, uh, pop music, Middle Eastern music. Uh, my parents were avid listeners, but they were both pharmacists. And living in Jordan, um, or in any Arab country for that matter, there's an expectation that kids will become either, you know, you either become a doctor, uh, a lawyer, an engineer, or a disgrace to your family, basically. <laughs> so if you're not one of the first three, you're a disgrace to your family. So when I told my, fa you know, I, I was taking piano lessons at age five, started composing at age 16. And when I told my parents that I want to become a musician professionally, um, even though I was a straight A student at school, you know, in sciences and literature and all that, they, they you know, they agreed because they, um, they both studied pharmacy against their will. Uh, my mom wanted to become a, an artist and she got a scholarship to study art in the UK, but her dad didn't allow it. And, uh, you know, told her you should become a pharmacist instead. And my, my dad has always wanted to be a violinist, but also became a pharmacist due to family pressure. So when I said I wanted to become a musician, they, they supported me against the, you know, they, they were swimming against the current in a way when they supported me in that. So did, I'm forever grateful to them both. Did your parents at some point actually get to fulfill their dream? Did they actually, even though they're both pharmacists, but did they actually get to pick up some instruments and <clears throat> learn it, learn along the way? Well, not really, unfortunately. I mean, they both kind of, you know, my mom passed away 14 years ago. Uh, had I she lived longer, that. she might have probably tried, you know, had she lived longer and, way past her kids have grown up she would have probably gotten herself into art in one way or another and my dad um my dad i mean he up he's sick now unfortunately but uh, up until his illness he was still listening to music and reading about music and you know just singing in his spare time so none of them really ended up learning what they wanted to learn but in their own words they 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 uh, let their kids be the outlet of the talents that they never get that they, that they never got to see materialize so they had the kids materialize those you know those uh, dreams so for my parents to see me a musician was a way for them bringing their dreams come true th through their kids you know because my other sister who's a year younger than me is a visual artist oh. and i have another brother who's a musician uh, so in a way, we ful we fulfilled their unfinished dreams. Okay. Yeah. So, at what moment? Because you started playing an instrument, I believe, it was the piano, right? Yeah. You started playing at a very young age. At what age did you start playing, and what is it that sparked your interest? Well, my aunt, my uh, my dad's sister, had a piano at her house, and she she was a pianist. You know, she had taken piano lessons in her childhood, so. That was my first exposure to a piano. And uh, I remember asking my parents if I can learn piano. So that's how the lesson started. And um, I honestly didn't really enjoy piano lessons. Uh, I think the teachers that I had up until I was 16, I didn't have good piano teachers. So I didn't really enjoy the lessons but I knew that I loved music. So at a certain point when my brother was born, I was nine years old, I composed a piece of music for him on the piano. Wow. It was a welcome song. Oddly enough, that brother became a composer himself. <laughs> um, but the, the point is that um, I realized later on that I actually love improvising on the piano way more than learning pieces and learning the techniques of playing and all that. So when I was 16, I started to compose a bit more seriously. And I was lucky to um, get accepted by a piano teacher called, uh, her name is Agnes Bashir, that was back in Jordan, and she's a composer herself. So she was teaching me piano, but also uh, helping me with my composing talent. And she kind of pushed me and she was like, you know, you definitely need to pursue comp composition because from what I hear, you, you have the talent and you're meant to do this. So I knew I, I wanted to become a composer and I went, you know, I went ahead to study music at the music conservatory in Damascus, the higher Institute of music. And then came to McGill on a scholarship uh, just to do a bachelor in music composition. So I fulfilled my dream, um, but it took a few years for me to get into my film music 
uh, side of the career. So, you know, it started as me playing piano and now I kind of, now I dip my toes in both the concert world and the film world. I, I get commissioned to write music for concerts, but I also get to work on films. Okay, back home, and because your English is not bad at all, actually, it's very good. Um, I would take it back home in Jordan. Uh, English is a second language that they teach, right? Yeah, English is a second language in Jordan. Most people are able to speak it at least in a in a conversational, functional way, you know. Um, but also, I uh, I grew up in an upper middle class. Um, society where um, I went to private British schools. So uh, those schools actually taught mainly English up until you were in like second grade where it became equally, you know, you, you had Arabic subjects and English subjects. So I studied science in both English and Arabic, math in both English and Arabic and so forth. And then I did a British high school diploma. So um, English is almost like a native language to me, but still, when I came to Canada, there were a lot of expressions that weren't really in my vocabulary, the, the expressions that you don't, don't find in books and, you know, in, in academic things, so. So when is it that you immigrated to Canada? I came in 2004. Okay, so oh, that, <clears throat> that's not too long ago. 17. Wow. 17 years ago, yeah. And how much different is the culture here compared to the culture in the Middle East? I mean, there's a, there's a big culture shock when you showed up here, right? Uh, yeah, it was a culture shock um, on several levels. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very different uh, way of life. Um, I would say that the main shock was the weather, to be honest, more than anything. <laughs> like, I never knew in my life that there would... Because we arrived on January 24th. 2004 and the temperature was like negative 24 on that day <laughs> and I my impression of cold was you know windy like in Jordan if it's windy it's chilly that's our impression of the cold weather and I remember stepping outside of the Pearson International Airport and being like it's not cold and the minute I said the word cold I felt my insides freeze <laughs> and it was like that that was the main shock for me but also um I mean, there are many pros and cons to each country. Um, it's a different lifestyle, I would say, over here. You know, there are things here that I take for granted that aren't available uh, in the Middle East. Uh, but there are things in the Middle East that I wish we had here. So, you know, um, you know, I miss certain things about that part of the world. And because I lived so long over there, I still have them in me. You know, like I was 22 when I came here. So... It's not like I came as a child and only knew Canada. I've lived independently in Syria on my own as an 18-year-old and, you know, developed my own circle of friends and a lot of things. So I still miss uh, aspects of that part of the world, which is why I tend to visit a lot. If you'll pardon the pun, on a more positive note, <laughs> when is it that you started composing? So I started composing at a, like I well I wrote that song for my brother when I was nine, but I wouldn't call that starting composing. I, I started composing in earnest when I was sixteen. Um, for me, I wasn't your typical high school kid who's popular and whatever. I was a nerd, you know, always getting high high grades in school. Uh, had a few friends, not too too many friends, and I sat a lot on my own at home listening to. Uh, my dad's collection of music and realized that I am enjoying listening and then enjoying kind of going to the piano and coming up with my own pieces. And then eventually I started writing them down. That was way before computers were, you know, co computer software for composing was available. So I would have my, my you know, my sheet music, uh, the partiture with like my pencil and I would write down what I'm playing and a piano, you know, the, 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 I, I wrote like four piano pieces back then that for me were where the seal, they sealed the deal for me. That's okay, this is what, what I want to do for the rest of my life. I have so much music in me and I want it to, to be written. Okay, and when is it that you decided that, hey, you know what, I love music and all that, but I want to start writing music for film. Well, at which moment did you decide that you wanted to go into that? So I think I've known always because, um, my mother kind of like uh, planted that idea in my head that, oh, you know, 
she she planted it in my head as a as a career option where I can bring my composing talent into good use, you know, because it's not just, you know, because when you think about music, how, how do you make music a profession? So she was thinking in terms of a profession, like, oh, if you want to become a composer, then guess what? You can write music for film. That would be amazing. And in a way for me, it was something that she mentioned and then it started growing on me. And as someone who loves storytelling myself and loves films, um, I always knew that I wanted to do film music, even though it took me long to, to actually start doing it. I I knew it since I was around 16 that I do want to do film music. And even though I went to McGill, which is a great school uh, of music, but not in the world of film music. McGill is an, uh, is an avant-garde school of composing, you know, and, um, their style is very different than me. I'm a person who likes to write tonal music that, you know, that has some ethnic influences in it every once in a while, not always, but I am, film is my passion and writing for film is extremely different than what um, McGill was teaching us. However, at McGill, I took a course called uh, Music in Film and it was an elective. It wasn't a requirement for any music student. Uh, it was an elective that's offered for students of any faculty. I took it and our homework was to watch films and analyze the scores, you know, in conversations. But then we had a homework assignment where we were asked to watch um, The Talented Mr. Ripley, which is a film, I think it was released in 1999 and Gabriel Yared was the composer. Uh, I had to write like a 10 page uh, essay analyzing the score of that. And it was due to that score that I, kind of knew that, okay, like film music is where I should be. And and this is what I want to do. So you've written the musical scores for 30 projects in there. There's film. Have you done any web series, radio or, or television among your projects? Yeah, I've done a web series from Jordan based on Samuel Beckett's uh, Waiting for Godot. Uh, it's like it's based on that, you know, that world. And I've done uh, a mini series for CBC. Uh, and what else have I done? I've done like music for podcasts as well, but the majority of my work is in independent cinema, um, be it Canadian, Canadian very recently. Most of my work is actually in, is in independent Arab cinema uh, with a few projects from outside that world. Okay. And Canadian, like more recently Canadian, within the past two years, I've been hired a lot on Canadian Canadian projects since 2018. Have you at some point worked on uh, some Hollywood projects? Uh, not yet, no. That That's something that you're looking at? I would like that, of course. I mean, every composer's dream is to reach Hollywood and, you know, do something that's Hollywood related. Uh, I would definitely want to do that. Um, as long as I don't veer away from my own uh, artistic voice in a way, you know? Um, and by voice, I don't mean style because, um, or let's say, it, let, me, let me rephrase that. By voice, I don't mean genre because you can compose in many different genres while maintaining your style as a composer and your voice. So, you know, I love writing for comedy. I love writing for thrillers. I love writing for drama. Uh, these are extremely different genres of film, but I have my signature, in, if you will, you know, my signature sound that can get transferred into these genres. So I would love to score a Hollywood film and I would love for that film to uh, be a film where I can showcase my, uh, my composing voice. Okay, you were a student at the Canadian Film Center, and the film that you were involved in, uh, I believe, is that, did you write that film? Uh, so my graduation project from the Canadian Film Center, which is called the, show, the Composer's Showcase piece, uh, was a dream project where, as a composer, I get to be for the first time, and probably the last time in my life, the showrunner. It's a film based on my vision. So the, the story is mine. The, the idea of the film is based on my story, but I didn't write the script. I just contributed the story to the director and then we worked it together. And then the director wrote it along with uh, another screenwriter and turned it into, into the film. Um, 
so my contribution to that film is that it was based on my vision. I had to provide a lookbook in terms of the style, how stylized I wanted to be, what, you know, like a lot of things regarding that. But then I got to see it being directed. And, you know, I was on the, the shoot. It was a one day shoot. Um, that was ex one of probably the most important days of my life, not just because this film um, ended up looking the way it looked and ended up being nominated. You know, it, it got nominated at the Hollywood Music and Media Awards in the short film live action category, uh, along with four other films that are from Hollywood, like that are from composers based in Hollywood, which is amazing, you know. But that being on the shoot for that film wasn't um, in retrospect, uh important just because of that but it was also a, a look into the the world of shooting films as a composer we don't get to do that a lot we're never we're almost never on set we work in post production right so being on the set and seeing that it seeing the amount of work it took before getting to the day of the shoot not mm -hmm. even the day of the shoot like seeing we had to be there choosing costumes we had to be there scouting locations we had to be involved in every step until the day of the shoot where I had to be a fly on the wall. The, the, the day of the shoot, the composer had got to be a fly on the wall. But seeing how making a six minute film, how much time and effort and how many people it takes to make it and all the logistics that go behind that was mind blowing. And that's why that day, like it was an 11 hour shoot that those wow. 11 hours I will treasure for the rest of my life because they opened my, my eyes and my mind to to a process that i was never aware of you know it was so amazing we have an excerpt of that six minute film so this is crazy ladies and gentlemen this is this was a project and next thing you know it ends up in hollywood and it could have been nominated for best director best actor it's too bad because it wasn't eligible you were saying right well, by laws of the Canadian Film Center, these composer showcase pieces don't go to, cannot be submitted to festivals because of uh, because of contractual issues with people working in them. You know, because I think it's mostly volunteers or something like that. H had we been able to submit it to festivals, the director Michael uh, Mazuka would have definitely won an award. The production designer Josh Turpin, who turned now when you look at the clip. The location where we filmed was a blank slate apartment. This was an apartment with no furniture and white walls. And he turned it into something out of like Amélie Poulain overnight down to the smallest knickknack based on my vision. And then once the shoot was over, he had to take everything out, his furniture, his decorations, and paint it back to white again. So. He would have definitely won an, an award as well, in, in, including the, the uh, main actors and everything. So it, it's a shame we couldn't do it. But I mean, the film uh, it rules are rules. And the film uh, the, got nominated for best score in Hollywood, which in and of itself is an achievement because my name was read in front of like Alan Silvestri and, uh, you know, Junkie XL and uh, Christoph Beck and Michael Abels and all those big names who were sitting there. Uh, my name was right in front of them, and that in, a, in and of itself was a win for me, even though that, I didn't win that here. And that must be amazing because Alan Silvestri did the scores for The Avengers, among other movies, and he also did Castaway. That's my favorite movie of all times. Uh, Alan Silvestri, that must have been one big honor for you. It, it was, and I'm, I'm a bit, I'm a bit uh, sad that I didn't manage to catch him. Like uh, I, I lost <laughs> where he was after he, because he won an award that night. And I tried to find him, and I never managed <laughs> to find him and say hello. But I mean, it, it, yeah, it was a huge honor to, to to be in Hollywood amongst all these names and have my name read there. You know, you'll hear it here first, okay? You hear it here first. You're gonna meet Alan Silvestri. You're gonna meet him. Yeah. You have a chance to meet him. In the meantime, let's show the audience that amazing clip. Uh, it's part, it's an excerpt of the six minute short film that went to Hollywood. Our guest tonight is uh, Swad Bushnak. Audrey has a very important appointment this morning. It's one that she has been eagerly anticipating for a long, long time. 
You see, Audrey was born to sleep. In fact, if sleeping were a sport, Audrey would be a gold medalist. Stackhouse, how are you? <laughs> Mind uh, signing right there? Uh... Yeah. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, perfect. Have a nice day. Mm. Oh, hello, Paul. Wow. <laughs> so so that film is the film there that, that you got nominated for. I love the music in there. It's just amazing. Thank you. It's uh it was composed during a time where I was on a plane at least once a month. So it got composed in different countries. Poland, uh, you know, at the Krakow Film Music Festival, I was there composing overnight after my workshop and like in in Norway and in LA and in many places. Um, and actually, uh, the EP for this film, the album is coming out in June. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> oh, that's going to be amazing. Yeah. It's, so, it's exciting because it was, um, we got the music recorded here live in Toronto. And um, yeah, th th this was a dream project. It it's one of the my, my favorite projects. <laughs> so, so, you, you were staying backstage that you got nominated three times for your musical scores. So you flew to LA, you got into that nice glamorous dress, you were sitting down, hoping maybe you were going to get an award. You came back empty-handed, but this time around, something different happened. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine, you know, 2018, I'm a new mom, I have my... Uh, how old was my son? My son was like not even six months old yet. I flew to LA with him uh, because I got nominated. Went to the ceremony, you know, with my gown. Uh, didn't win. <laughs> Following year, got nominated for what we just watched. Did this the, the same thing. Went to the ceremony in Hollywood uh, at the Avalon Hollywood. Walked the red carpet. <laughs> didn't win. And this year, sitting alone, home alone in Toronto on my couch in my pajamas, lo and behold, wow, <laughs> <I won> the award. <laughs> so, so you won the award. Yes. So this year, I won it for um, if, in a different category. I won it uh, for what was the category? Best instrumental performance. Wow. Orchestra for one of my orchestral pieces called Tomorrow. And the, it was uh, basically a video of the world premiere at Concert House Berlin by the Syrian Expat Philharmonic Orchestra. That video, I sent it to the awards and it got nominated. And uh, I cleared a shelf on my bookshelves because I felt I had a feeling I'm going to win. But I actually did it for the nomination even. But I just like had a feeling the third time is a charm, you know? And it was a charm. So. <laughs> Do you have that award handy that you could show us? Uh, it's right here. <laughs> Let me see. I hope I don't break it. Is no, it God forbid. Take it's your time. Heavy. Take your time. Oh, wow. It's what is that award? Is, is that the HMMA award? Yes, this is Hollywood Music and Media Awards HMMA. Okay, and, and winning such an award from... Uh, I gather that is a very, very... Oh, wow, that's a beautiful trophy. Look at it's that. Beautiful, wow. yeah. Mm. You know what? Take the time, go put it back safely, and then I'm going to ask another question. Yeah. <laughs> Just make sure it gets there safely. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, so the, the HMME Awards, the Hollywood Music and Media Awards, they're very prestigious awards. What could that do in terms of um, you know, recognition for a composer such as yourself? It's, uh, I mean, a recognition, you know, recognitions are important when they come from entities that are respected, right? So to have an entity like this uh, recognize my achievements uh, kind of puts my name out there in front of, you know, people who, people in the industry who are A-list composers, you know, who, who do, uh, you know, who do keep an eye out for younger composers like myself. Uh, as well as maybe even filmmakers. Um, I mean, recognition is important because it's like someone is vouching for you, you know? You can keep saying that your work is great, you can keep writing great work, but unless I feel that unfortunately in our, business, in our industry, even though it's not a necessity, I mean, there are amazing, amazing pieces of music that never get any awards, you know, amazing film scores that never get nominated and they are still amazing. Nothing will change that. But it's precisely because of how difficult it is to get recognition in the music world and film world that a recognition like this becomes super um, important and you know uh, beneficial because of how difficult it is. Like last night was Oscar night, you know? Yes. Last night was, the, was the Oscars. I know a ton of, not a ton, like I know some great film scores that got shortlisted Mm. or best score that never even made it. They got shortlisted, but they didn't make it to a nomination or nominated, but didn't make it to a win. So it's like a, a multi-layered process, right? And that's why a win is important. The other thing that I did notice is that um, my nominations, like the last year and the year before were important, but I also realized that the difference it is when you actually win um, because um, my win got covered by the BBC, for example, because of the story about uh, an orchestra made up of Syrian uh, musicians living in Europe who played, you know, music by a half Syrian composer, makes it to Hollywood, like from Damascus to Hollywood. So winning kind of <laughs> opened my eyes to the, to the difference it makes because a nomination is great, but apparently a win is even better. So, you know, recognition opens doors, I'd like to think. But most importantly, uh, especially after this uh, crazy year we've been in, 2020, uh, getting a recognition like that was important for me on an emotional and mental level, right? Because it's been a tough year for everyone. So when you get something like this, Definitely. you're like, okay, I'm on the right track, you know? It's nice. I, I'm doing what I should be doing. And I'm going to continue because someone just gave me like a, an ego boost or, you know, a, <laughs> Push of motivation in a way. So uh, three years ago, you got recognized. Uh, uh, recognized. Well, it's a form of recognition. You were selected as a high-profile official at the Slate Music Presidency at the Canadian Film Center. Tell us about that a little bit. I got selected as a resident. Oh. Uh, high-profile official. Uh. Well, okay. Uh. Hi, okay. Is it high-profile pro official, or were you a resident? I was, was a resident, it? so basically oh, you were a resident. Okay, sorry. I don't know. I don't know if the words mean. I don't know what the word means, but what I will tell you is that um, the residency at the Canadian Film Center is basically hundreds of people apply and okay. only six get accepted. So maybe this is what the high. Yeah, and that's yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes. because it's uh, it's not an easy thing to get into. Like it's it's uh, they're very extremely selective and. Uh, I was lucky to to be selected in 2018 amongst a wonderful group of musicians. We were six composers, and um, it was life changing because um, you know uh, I got to uh, see I, I got to be recognized in Canadian cinema. I got to work with Canadian filmmakers, and in a way that kind of opened my world to Canadian cinema, which is something I hadn't done before joining the uh, before joining the CFC. Okay, we also got recognized by someone who's very, very, very high up there, a very prominent composer, a European composer, a German composer by the name of Hans Zimmer. He recognized you. Uh, in which way? Uh, what did he say exactly? Uh, how did this come about? How did Hans Zimmer recognize you? 
So I'm actually, I love Hans Zimmer. I think he's one of the, the, not just the best composers out there, but he was one of the coolest human beings because he's so down to earth. So uh, many years ago, I think in 2013, uh, I found him on Facebook and sent him a friend, friend risk request and he accepted. And it, I, I, you know, people always wonder, is this the real Hans Zimmer? Is it someone pretending to be him? But it turned out to be him because I used to send him some of my music and he would listen and tell me, you know, like bravo or anything like that. Um, and when this piece tomorrow came out, I sent it to him in a message and told him about the piece and he actually listened and loved it. Um, and then uh, after that, I ended up, uh, I went to LA in April uh, of 2018 and I thought I'd love to meet Hans Zimmer. So I asked if I could meet him and uh, he was generous enough to not just meet me, but actually like arrange for a one hour meeting in his famous studio in Santa Monica, which is like, just amazing you know like it took me a minute it, it took me the first 30 seconds when i was saying hi to him i was in a daze you know <laughs> but then I nine and a half minutes that remained it was like chatting with a friend he's so down to earth such a wonderful person so all this to say that uh he ended up hearing my next um uh orchestral piece which is called the borrowed dress and he shared it on his facebook profile that was months after this meeting and uh, then he wrote a comment under a new orchestral work of mine that I was premiering. Um, he wrote a comment saying, go and listen to this incredible artist's music. So wow. it's, it means the world, uh, you know, to, uh, to have the recognition of someone like him, because if, even with that video of the piece called The Borrowed Dress, the, the orchestral piece that uh, he listened to, I remember, I remember like the, making the video, you know, uh, working on it for a whole year between editing, editing and, you know, sound design and all that. And I posted it on Facebook and I didn't get a fraction of the likes or comments that I wanted. And I remember going to bed really feeling blue, like all this work, you know, this piece had a, it was performed in a full house in Berlin. Uh, people were clapping for like a, a long time for it and i i went through the effort of putting it on video and you know no one it's not getting half the recognition it deserves so i go to sleep and the following morning i wake up to see that hans zimmer shared it on his facebook wow like this <laughs> this is all i needed you know like i don't need the 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 the, the hundreds of likes if he shared it so it's, it's nice to get the support the emotional support of uh, an a-list composer because again a comment from someone like him means that I am doing things right. You know, I'm not, I, I don't have an imposter syndrome. Uh, my work is good. It's good enough for someone like Hans Zimmer to, to do that like this. So uh, it, that was also a huge boost of morale for me. Uh, uh, Rob's Inner Circle team and you share a common friend by the name of Patricia Chica, a prominent film producer here in Montreal. Uh, how did you meet Patricia? So uh, Patricia, I met her um, two times, let's say. The first time I met her was at the Toronto International Film Festival. Uh, it, I think it was in 2018. Yes, it was in 2018. Um, because I had heard about a film uh, called Montreal Girls through the um, TIFF Filmmakers Lab. I don't know what it's actually called, but um it's a it's a talent lab uh, an accelerator accelerator lab and i heard that there's a film called montreal girls about a middle eastern student who comes to study at mcgill in canada and has and and basically ends up finding his true self so i i wanted to seek out like who's the who's the director of this film i saw her name and i sort of sought her out asked to meet her and um she was generous enough to connect me with her producers and we met at the Toronto Film Festival, but she was, I think, still in the early stages of the film. And then we met again in 2019 in Los Angeles. Uh, I was there um, with the Canadian Film Center, actually, because part of our residency is to go to Los Angeles for a week to meet industry professionals there. And I stayed uh, longer and I ended up meeting her there and uh, we talked more about the film and we, you know, she promised me to reach out to me when it's time for the score and she kept her promise and reached out to me this December. 
and uh, we've been uh, working on a beautiful score for her beautiful film. It's a, it's a gorgeous film, very poetic, and um, the score is starting to take shape now. Um, it's uh, it's it's nice to work with a director who who really knows what she wants, uh, but also gives freedom to the uh, to the composer to to be creative. You know, so it's been a pleasure to work with her and to to see this film come to come to life. And you know, we're you know I have a few more cues to write for her, and it's nice to think to see things take shape. Uh, and to work with someone who appreciates that, you know, because uh, as as composers, we are always under pressure and we work, you know, we're very, we work with different types of people. So it's nice to to work with someone who you feel is is on your side and who wants you to, to do your best and to, uh, you know, who supports you emotionally as well. And Patricia is an editor as well. So um, when uh, you girls get together, um, I guess... Um, you know, it's making that music fit in that particular scene. And sometimes, you know, it's, I don't know if it's a, a minute and 30 seconds. Uh, you have the, well, I wouldn't say challenge, but the, the duty, the job to make your music fit in that little stretch. And that could be, that could be something, um, uh, that could be like a, a big feat to, to take over. Because, you know, if, you, if you're playing at a 120 tempo beat, and then all of a sudden you have to slow it down to 80. You have to make that fit in the bars there. That could be a little bit uh, challenging sometimes. Yeah, and that's part of the job of a composer. You know, we uh, we get a cut. We compose to it. We have to hit certain cuts. So, you know, you get the, the scene you wanna that you want to score. Um, you time everything so that it, it hits specific moments in the in the scene. You know, like someone grabbing something or throwing something or a gesture or a facial expression and then uh with the with you know with editing things can change in a different cut in a different cut of the film so if you're moving from you know fine cut to picture lock things can change and it's a challenge for the composer especially if you've worked hard on a specific cue but it's my job to stretch time to make it fit so basically in my software i can i would end up either editing my own music or sometimes, uh, you know, making minute uh, changes in the tempo in order for the music to fit. But it's a long process. However, the nice thing that um, that we did, uh, or the nice and different thing that uh, we did with Patricia was that when she contacted me in December, she wanted to cut to my music. So it was a backwards process, which is something that not all directors do. But because she edit, she was editing to, she wanted to edit to music because she's musical inside her, you know. So we worked in a, a little bit in a backwards uh, way where I composed music and then she would edit to it and then I would tweak the music to fit the new edit. Um, which is why when you when you see the film eventually, you will see how everything is like perfect because she she took her time to kind of make sure that everything is meticulous and you know, uh, the rhythm of the of the scenes flows nicely because she likes to edit to music. Well, I, I can understand what you're saying because uh, anyone who has like a song and they want to put a music video to that, uh, that's exactly what's happening is that yeah. you are putting picture to sound and not sound to picture. So, yeah. and you were saying as well, an editor is usually someone who is inclined to have um, a passion rhythm. for music as well, rhythm. Yeah, editor, editors are composers' best friends. You know, it's uh, it's important for composers to know who the editor is in a film and to to speak to the editor and to see what the editor's uh, idea for the music is. You know, and um, anyone who edits a film is usually very uh, very musically knowledgeable. So it's important to to connect with the the ed film editor early on in the process. Have you taken any uh, classes, um, let's say, in theater or maybe acting? Uh, have you done that? I've never taken formal classes in acting uh, at all. Although one of my maybe like alter ego dreams is to be an actress, but <laughs> maybe in a different life, <laughs> parallel yeah. universe, or maybe later on. You know, I would like I, I would actually like to have a role as an actor at one someday. What's stopping you? Minor, minor role. 
Well, you, you can always do it. There's, there's nothing stopping you. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> so it's going uh, to happen maybe after flying lessons and after learning uh, Japanese. I, <laughs> but it's going to happen. <laughs> Uh, and speaking of flying, you, you're uh, when you were back in Jordan, you were telling me that you wanted to be an airline pilot. Yeah, that was like a serious uh, dream of mine. Well, uh, you know what? We we share the same passion. I'm an avid aviation fa uh, fanatic. Oh wow! I love aviation. Yeah, I know everything about airplanes. I'm just afraid to go on them. Oh, I know everything about airplanes. Did you know that some pilots are actually afraid to fly? That's interesting. I didn't know that. No. Yeah, that's, that's something that a pilot has told me, and it's it's absolutely it's absolutely crazy when you think of it, you know. But oh it makes God. sense because you know we all have our own little thing, right? Yeah. Would I want to be on a plane with a pilot who's scared of flying? I'm not sure, but <laughs> well, I don't think it's a good idea to put that up on the intercom. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right, Jen Pilot Bob. <laughs> and I'd like to tell you that I'm scared of flying, but you have are a afraid? Flight. <laughs> yeah. How about you? Are you afraid of flying? You know what's funny? I'm scared of heights in the sense that I can't look down my balcony railing, or if I'm up on an escalator, I can't look behind me. I can't go down a hill without holding someone's hand. Like oh, I'm yeah. very scared of heights. However, I love being on an airplane. And it's because it's a closed space. Like I know if the if you know the only way for me to go down is if the plane goes down. And if that happens, then I uh, it's, it's going to be too short for me to 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 be scared anyway. <laughs> but I get major dizziness if I'm like on like I would never jump out of a plane or do bungee jumping even if they pay me millions of dollars <laughs> to do that. I'm never going to do that. I don't do roller coasters, anything that's high and on a on an like you know open high spaces i i don't do that stuff mm, okay. yeah <laughs> okay so how, how about <laughs> eventually... i'm fine as long as i'm inside them and not jumping out of them i'm fine <laughs> how about eventually are you thinking maybe a career in directing or producing honestly you know i would i think i would like to direct uh a short film. I have a couple ideas for short films that I would probably like to try directing, but I'm the type who likes to do something if I know I'm really good at it. And I'm also the type who's like, you know, if there's someone who really knows how to do this thing, let them do it. Uh, unless I'm really passionate about something. So I'd love to direct a short film maybe at some point. Um, but most likely I will need help because I, I wouldn't want to pretend that I know how to direct and end up doing a job that's, you know, half and half. So I, I, I'd rather do what I'm really good at, uh, but maybe like give it a shot, but have someone supervise or, you know, or to, to perfect. I'm a perfectionist. So I, I find it very hard to do something subpar or n not fully there. Um which is a, you know, it's a, what do you call it? A, a vice in disguise? Is that even a saying? Yeah, I, it makes sense. I make make that. That up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, I make up my own uh, my own words too. Like I made up yeah. this word, you know, like I, I always wanted to be Jewish, so I made up this word called Shabbatsky. So yeah, everybody makes up words. Sure. <laughs> a blessing in disguise is the actual term, but okay. I try to say something the opposite of that. Anyway. Uh, you get you get what I'm saying, I guess. Exactly. Um, how much different is filming in North America compared to what goes on in the Middle East and Europe? What are the similarities or the differences? Um, I, I would probably compare them in in terms of like um, independent cinema versus studio films, which are what we call Hollywood films. So if we were to think about independent cinema coming from the Middle East or Europe, um, or just middle, uh, or just like independent cinema that has um, a European style in mind, you know, or has a European school of thinking, let's put it that way. Uh, I would say these are usually films that, when it comes to the score, tend to be very minimalist, if there is a score in, at all. And tend to be a bit slower in their in their pacing and in their you know montage and in their cutting. Um, I personally find that I'm not an expert, but I can tell you that 
you know, Hollywood films usually require more music, bigger music. Uh, the aesthetic is a bit different. They are also most of them, and I'm not I'm not generalizing, but there is that thought um, that Hollywood films tend to also have like uh, faster pacing. Um, these these are the two general um, things that I find differ between the two. So besides filmmaking, you also have other talents. You're also involved with the orchestra because at the beginning of the show, when we started off our show tonight, the piece that was being played tomorrow is actually something that you compose. So you're part of an orchestra. Well, I compose for orchestras, yes. So, um, you know, with, with my film scoring, usually I'm writing music that is more or less, you know, film scoring is, is more or less a, a supportive role, right? So you're, you're writing music to fill in a blank in the scene. Uh, scenes in, in film have, you know, you have the picture, the dialogue, the sound effects, and if needed, there's a score, but you don't always need a score. Uh, when I compose for orchestra, it's a completely different uh, mindset and completely different way of work because uh, composing for the concert world, you know, I'm in my full uh, artist mode right now and you are allowed to have an ego in the sense that I can write whatever I want because it's music for the sake of music. It's music in service of music. Whereas um, scoring for film, uh, is a completely different part of the brain. You know, you're trying to solve a puzzle or to to uh, to fix a situation through music. Uh, so it's a completely different way of thinking. Uh, they're both composing, uh, but but they I feel they they involve different parts of my personal brain. So my work with uh, orchestras happened because this orchestra called the Syrian Expat Philharmonic Orchestra opened the door for me actually when. In 2015, its founder, Ra'e Jazbe, who's one of my colleagues from Damascus, uh, he decided to um, bring together the German musicians, um, uh, sorry, the Syrian musicians who are living in Europe and bring them together to play in one orchestra as opposed to them just playing with different ensembles across Europe. And he asked me if I had any music uh, for orchestra. I said yes, but I didn't. And then I went and wrote music for orchestra. So uh, I sort of became the or one of the orchestra's uh, composers in residence because every subsequent concert that they did, they were either playing a piece of mine or premiering a, a new piece of mine. So it is thanks to this orchestra that uh, other orchestras came to know about my orchestral music, like the Vermont Symphony, for example, which uh, played my music and eventually ended up uh, commissioning me to uh, compose a cello concerto for them, which will be premiered in October. So that's, uh, yeah, that's a totally like different avenue of my life as a composer. Equal, equally as fun, but very different than film composing. Okay, there, there are many people out there and myself included. Um, every, you know, the whole environment, everything around us, everything emits a sound and a sound equals a note. Like I'll give you an example. My doorbell is going to ring. I'm going to go, oh, that's an F sharp. Uh, you're going to hear the, the a horn honking. Oh, that's a C sharp. Uh, you're going to hear the interact machine. That's a B flat. Do you have that kind of instinct yourself? Uh, so I, I mean, you know, on days when I've been working a lot on my own music, if something like that happens, just by virtue of reference in my ears, I would just start to guess, is this an E, is it an E sharp? Sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't. But uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not someone born with perfect pitch or absolute pitch. People born with that don't need any references to tell you that this is an E sharp or an E flat, and they don't even have to be musicians. People with perfect pitch, all they need to know is their solfege. And then, you know, every single time they hear a note, they're going to identify it based on their innate um, gift of being someone with perfect pitch. Um, and it's a gift because they actually, there's a joke, how do you, how do you know if someone has perfect pitch? They will oh. tell you. <laughs> <laughs> because they're only 1% of, I think they're only 1% of society. Mm -hmm. so like a very small percentage of society that has it. So those who have it are pretty proud of it. Um, but also it could be a curse. I have a violinist friend of mine who has perfect pitch. She's a fantastic violinist. And she says that listening to music is exhausting sometimes to her because she ends up 
reciting the, the note names as she's listening. So if she's listening to like, imagine. yeah, uh, you know, a, a violin concerto, she's instead of listening, she's actually going and reciting all the <laughs> note names. So it's, um, I'm going to use my made up uh, <laughs> saying it's a curse in disguise again. <laughs> It's a Shabatsky. <laughs> it's a Shabatsky. <laughs> okay, I, I was once told that at one point that anyone who is good in mathematics has a very good chance of being a musician. So there is a correlation. You're actually a math teacher. Yeah. <laughs> so there is a correlation. Yeah, I've always been good at math when I was in school. I loved math, and uh, after I graduated from music composition from McGill. Uh, a year later, I went back to McGill and I did my bachelor in education. And I did not do music education because I actually don't really enjoy teaching music that much. Uh, but I did it in general education. And I was particularly particularly interested in math education for the elementary classroom. Um, so I concentrated on that. And I got hired as a math teacher uh, in North Carolina for two years. Um, and in a way where like the tables you know in a way where things come to a full circle some of my best students happened to be musicians uh, i was teaching 10 and 11 year olds and those who really got the math equations and concepts quickly were students who play an instrument so the, the correlation it's, it's like circular you know music helps you with math and math helps you with music as well you were saying backstage that you have aspirations as uh, starting your own podcast one day. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I think with this pandemic, uh, I got to talk to a lot of my long lost friends in a way uh, over Zoom and connecting with a lot of uh, my friends who happen to be Arab women like myself. And it's amazing how many of our thoughts uh, are similar and are evolving. So you know, an idea came that why not start our own podcast where we just sit and chat and uh, it might happen one day. I, I'd like for it to happen at some okay. point. <laughs> okay, Here, here's a uh, big question for you. Where does your true happiness come from? Hmm. Interesting question. Where does my true happiness come from? I would say there are two main sources. Uh, Music has always been a source of happiness for me. Like, I'm not saying it in any sort of uh, romanticized way. Um, I, as someone with a very diverse ethnic identity, you know, I'm Syrian, Palestinian, Bosnian. That's like every 20th century conflict you can think of in one person. <laughs> I really, for me, writing music was a way to combine all these identities in one place to call it home. Because I've never really lived in a place that is authentically my home in terms of blood, you know? Uh, like, I lived in Syria for a little bit, but I wasn't, you know, born and raised there. Same thing with my other ethnic backgrounds. So for me, music has always been a place where my identities, or like where my, where all my different ethnic identities are together in one place where that I can call home. So music has always been a, my source of happiness. This being said, I became a mother almost three years ago. I have a two and a half year old son right now, and it's amazing. I never thought in my life that a miniature little man uh, who is growing up every day, uh, who's funny and hilarious, could bring so much joy and so much love to my life. So when I'm done working during the day and I'm happy about this cue that I wrote or this award that I won or this film that I landed, uh, all I have to do is look at his face and hear him say one of his antics. And <laughs> that's like a completely different... Uh, source of happiness it's um uh, it's therapeutic really <laughs> you know that that's what makes you happy and you know what i i share that with you and I'm, I'm glad i'm happy for you but you know what makes me sad what is that the show's over oh no way the, the hour has gone by like this so oh fast my gosh. oh my god no you way. know i wish we had, we would have had another hour because we could could uh we could we could have gone on talking like forever here today yes. what a beautiful show yeah, thank you so much for your wonderful questions. And yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at the time now. I can't believe it. <laughs> it went fast. Hey, listen, you know what? Uh, like I said, 
Uh, please, uh, uh, you know, uh, stay um, stick around because after the show, when we close, we're going to have our meet and greet with the producer and uh, our podcast techie. But to close off the show, how about some closing comments coming from you? Uh, what would be your advice for anyone who wants to go into film, music, whatever, whatever they want to do? What's your advice? Uh, my advice would be, I guess, the same advice that uh, the film I'm working right now on, Montreal Girls, Patricia's film, uh, is about, which is follow your heart, you know. Um, never do anything in your life just because of societal expectations, you know. Do, do follow your heart, pursue your passion. Um, it, the road might be tough at the beginning, but once you're grounded and once you know how to drive in that road, it's the best feeling in the world to be able to wake up every morning and know that your main source of living, uh, you make a living by pursuing your passion. So, so persevere and it'll happen. You have a YouTube channel, eh? I have a YouTube channel. Just Google my name, S-U-A-D-B-U-S-H-N-A-Q, and you can find my orchestral works over there. Mainly. Fantastic. Swad, what a beautiful evening. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so and, much, uh, We'll be uh, coming back uh, to you in a couple of seconds. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. That was our guest tonight, Swad Bushnak, a, a composer, math teacher. She's part of the orchestra. Uh, an absolutely amazing and delightful guest we had tonight. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. We uh, urge you to be on next week, same time, same place, same reason, when we're going to be hosting the wonderful Jordan Kilgannon, who's a member of the Team Dunk Elite and creator of Bounce Kit. That's going to be another interesting show, and that's something you don't want to miss. In the meantime, thank you once again for tuning in, and good night and God bless. Ciao.